Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is James Winchell. Uh, I'm a reference librarian in the music division here at the Library of Congress. And uh, with such an exciting program tonight, exploring the Spanish tinge in early American piano music, I thought you might like to learn a little bit more about one of the first American musicians to really make an impact in Europe and also one of the first Pan-American celebrities, uh, Louis Moreau Gottschalk. The title of my lecture is Gottschalk's Old Souvenir Shop. This refers to a number of pieces that he wrote called souvenirs, which in French means memories. The point being that the memories of Gottschalk's upbringing in New Orleans and subsequent travels across Europe and South America informed not only his own compositions, but the overall development of American music in really unexpected ways. Gottschalk's mother and grandmother came to the United States via Saint-Domingue, which is now part of Haiti. Gottschalk's early life was bicultural, and he recalled early memories of hearing folk songs from Saint-Domingue sung by his grandmother and his family's house servant, Sally. As a child in New Orleans, he was also exposed to a wide variety of music from Africa, Cuba, and South America that was all part of the same cultural melting pot that would, many years later, produce an entirely new form of distinctly American music known as jazz. Gottschalk's familiarity with both Latin American and African American music informed his compositions from the start. In 1841, when Gottschalk was only 12 years old and had already shown a real talent at the piano, his father set him a sail to Paris to study both piano and composition. After initially being rejected from the Paris Conservatoire, apparently due to the fact that there were simply no good pianists in America, and so he couldn't possibly be qualified, he began piano study with Charles Halle and composition lessons with Pierre Maladin, who wrote a few books on music theory and composition and also was later the teacher of Camille Saint-Saëns. These lessons went quite well, and Gottschalk's prodigious talents flourished. Just a few years later in 1845, he presented a very successful recital in Paris at the Salle Pleyel, which was attended by both Frederick Chopin and Sigismund Thalberg, two of the most important pianist composers of the time, among other musical luminaries of the Paris scene. Apparently, the only reason Franz Liszt wasn't there was because he was on vacation um, away, uh, but he really wanted to be there. Um, Chopin was so impressed with the young pianist uh, that he made a point to congratulate him after the recital. As with many events of this kind, opinions vary on what exactly Chopin said to Gottschalk. He shook Gottschalk's hand, this is a young 16-year-old fellow, uh, shook his hand and either said, congratulations, very well done, or I predict that you will become the king of pianists. Uh, perhaps something in between, it depends on who's uh, whose source you want to believe. His, his sister is the one that said he's a, the king of pianists. That, that's how his sister reported it. Um, my sister would say the same thing. I don't think. Uh, undoubtedly, Gottschalk was becoming, even at the tender age of 16, the toast of Paris and a very accomplished pianist. None other than the great composer Hector Berlioz wrote, quote, Gottschalk is one of a very small number who possess all the different elements of a consummate pianist all the faculties which surround him with an irresistible prestige and give him a sovereign power. He is an accomplished musician. He knows just how far fancy may be indulged in expression. He knows the limits beyond which any liberties taken with the rhythm produce only confusion and disorder, and upon these limits he never encroaches. There is an exquisite grace in his manner of phrasing sweet melodies and throwing off light touches from the higher keys. The boldness and brilliance and originality of his playing at once dazzles and astonishes, and the infantile naiv naivete of his smiling caprices, the charming simplicity with which he renders simple things, seem to belong to another individuality distinct from that which marks his thundering energy. Thus, the success of Monsieur Gottschalk before an audience of musical cultivation is immense. That's what Berlioz had to say about the situation. He was never at a loss for words, Berlioz. <laughs> uh, around this same time, his abilities as a composer were also starting to develop. Gottschalk's early admiration for the, for the operas of Meyerbeer, 
informed his musical style as it did for many other 19th century composers. Side note here, Meyerbeer is one of the great unappreciated influences in 19th century music. Um, his operas don't get performed a lot anymore and we generally are not as familiar with his music as we should be if we really want to understand uh, what was happening in the 19th century, just FYI. Uh, but this is not about Meyerbeer, is it? Uh, in particular, his sense of harmony he got from Meyerbeer, his use of secondary dominance, uh, diminished triads, and third related chord progressions, which allowed him to move nimbly between the major and minor modes, which added a special emotional effect uh, to his piano pieces. The difference between Gottschalk and the other composers that had assimilated Meyerbeer's harmonic language into their compositions was that Gottschalk was an American, and more specifically, from New Orleans. The international and multicultural sounds of the city were in his musical DNA, and, took, and he took full advantage of that fact from his earliest published compositions. In 1849, his piano piece La Bambula and La Savane introduced the syncopated feel of the Haitian and Cuban music that Gottschalk has heard as, had heard as a child to the European salon audience. These two pieces, along with Le Bananier and Le Massalmillier, which were published a year later and written in a similar style, became known as the Louisiana Quartet. Those four pieces were the quartet. And established the 20-year-old Gottschalk as a legitimate star among the pianist composers of the Paris scene. The most distinctive rhythm of these pieces, which was derived from the Latin contradanza, is probably best known to American audiences today as the habanera. Thanks to Georges Bizet, he, who wrote Carmen some 20 years after the pieces we're discussing, just to put it in proper context, uh, we probably all know what a habanera, what a, what a habanera sounds like. Right? Uh, and so it doesn't seem particularly unusual to hear it in a piano piece. However, uh, it, is, was, it was a very savvy decision for Gottschalk if one imagines the Paris Salon of 1850, when Chopin's mazurkas were relatively new and Franz Liszt was in the, was in the midst of writing his Année de Pèlerinage, the Years of the Pilgrimage, uh, we find natural context for these pieces, which incorporate the native folk tradi traditions of the, art, of the artist, like Chopin did with the mazurka and the polonaise, and evoke the memory of far off lands in the manner of Liszt and his travels. But again, Gottschalk's Americanness is what made him unique. He found a place within the fashionable music of the day where he could make a contribution unlike anyone else. In an editorial note to the publication of these pieces, Gottschalk made this point himself, although he made it in the third person. It goes like this. Chopin, as is well known, transferred the national traits of Poland to his mazurkas and polonaises, and Mr. Gottschalk has endeavored to reproduce in his works the characteristic traits of the dances of the West Indies. Of course, unbeknownst to Gottschalk, his syncopated rhythms and use of, of Latin American melodic contours would also anticipate elements of both ragtime and jazz music. Of course, he had no idea about this because such things didn't exist at the time. Uh, which is why uh, we hear the Danza by Gottschalk uh, featured on this evening's program. Um, I'd like to play a little bit of La Bambula uh, for you to let you hear what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not sure how to unlock this computer, so my friend David Plylar <laughs> will be coming in as my lovely assistant. Thank you, David. <laughs> And when we hear La, Bam La Bambula, uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the few pieces by Gottschalk that people now will tend to hear. La Bambula and the banjo are the two uh, that, that tend to get played every so often. Uh, but in this piece, you'll hear that distinctive habanera rhythm, t t t t t t t t but instead of in the bass, like you'd expect uh, from hearing Carmen, you'll hear it in, in the upper voice. So let's uh, get a little bit. 
Jerusalem, so the dance that we hear uh, that is more familiar. Uh, and he's incorporated it into a style here that's not particularly Latin American sounding per se, but he's incorporated those rhythms and the syncopation into a kind of grand piano, uh, you know, not sort of standard 19th century style. So it's interesting uh, to hear that. Um, Gottschalk's success in Paris uh, led to a series of international tours over the next two decades that would expand his musical and cultural perspective, beginning with a wildly successful series of concerts in Spain, during which he wrote his first musical souvenir, the Souvenir d'Andalusie, which is the souvenir of the Andalusian mountains, and many other pieces that evoke the Spanish style. Uh, Gottschalk then toured the United States, followed by a tour of the Antilles, including Cuba and Puerto Rico, uh, where he wrote the danza that is on this evening's program, as well as his souvenir to Puerto Rico, which is a fantastic piece. I definitely recommend listening to that. Then he came back to the United States, and then a long tour of South America. This is over the course of, of uh, two decades, uh, where he spent multiple years uh, in these places. All of these tours, which I'm mentioning very quickly, were in, were in fact uh, quite prolonged affairs that were incredibly strenuous, both mentally and physically, for Gottschalk. Uh, during a stay on the island of St. Thomas, he wrote in his diary, what charming souvenirs these four weeks so rapidly elapsed have left me. The happiness this peaceful country life gives me, solitude for me is repose, is the absence of the thousand, of the thousand distractions of this unquiet and giddy existence to which my career of nomad artist condemns me. In solitude, I find in reveries and contemplation fertile sources of inspiration." End quote. Gottschalk wrote numerous pieces titled Souvenirs throughout his career, invoking the spirit of the places he had visited, including Buenos Aires, Lima, and Havana. The Souvenir de Havan from 1859 is particularly charming and again utilizes the familiar habanero rhythm, this time in its more common place as a bass ostinato. Uh, in the second section of the piece, we'll also hear a real taste of the syncopated style that would become ragtime just a few decades later, and it explicitly shows where this Spanish tinge uh, that Jelly Roll Morton described as an essential element in jazz music uh, comes from. So we hear, uh, especially in the second section of this piece, which you'll, you'll notice, it, it knowing ragtime, what ragtime sounds like now, you can hear where, where those rhythms are put together in a similar way, uh, the syncopation particularly. Um, and in the first part, you'll hear the, the habanero again. <laughs> 
ching chong, so you know it's over, you know I'm gonna clap. Uh, but you hear in that piece a lot of you know, long stretches of modulations where he's, where he's visiting you know, various keys trying to get around to where he's going. Uh, and you hear that's what that's where the the Meyerbeer influence comes in, but the but the Spanish tinge in that piece, along with those syncopated rhythms, is what sort of pre forecasts this uh, this ragtime style in a kind of you know really interesting way. Um, so during his travels, um, Gottschalk often stayed in one place uh, long enough not only to compose new music uh, and perform multiple concerts, uh, but also to take on composition students. Uh, during his travels in Cuba, for instance, uh, one of those students was Ignacio Cervantes, uh, who adapted the Cuban contradanza for piano uh, in a very different way than Gottschalk, uh, and you'll hear a bit of that later this evening. So there are some pieces by uh, Cervantes on the, on the program tonight, and you can hear uh, in that a very different approach from what you've heard from Gottschalk in, in, uh, in uh, adapting this uh, Cuban, uh, Haitian style uh, into, into uh, sort of concert music. So uh, that'll be interesting. I'm not going to say any, any more about it. Uh, it'll be a nice surprise. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, Gottschalk was one of the first Pan-American celebrities uh, due to his extensive tours in the Caribbean and South America. Unlike many musicians of his day, uh, Gottschalk was very politically minded and was never hesitant to express his opinions. Uh, he deeply believed in the tenets of the American Republic. Uh, he saw the Constitution as a foundational document that should change with the times, especially during the Civil War, during which his staunchly pro-Union views were challenged by his slave-owning contemporaries who believed that owning slaves was their constitutional right. He countered this view by saying that society should not have to try to fit into the mold of the Constitution as it would or was originally written any more than a grown man should have to fit into the clothes of his youth. Uh, his anti-slavery and pro-Republican views were carried with him on his tours of South America and the Caribbean, where he regularly donated large sums of money, um, sorry, regularly donated large sums of money to bolster public education in the areas that he visited and believed wholeheartedly that territories that were gaining their independence from Spain and other European nations should adopt a government similar to that in the United States. His opposition to European colonialism was of course very much in line with the Monroe Doctrine which had been introduced in the 1820s. During his concerts and public appearances, he often made a point of combining local folk songs with patriotic tunes from the United States into one piece to promote through his music the political unity that he hoped for. His souvenirs, which evoked the character of the countries he had visited, was another way that Gottschalk paid musical tribute to the local audiences that he believed could flourish without the influence of colonial forces. Despite his successes in Europe and Latin America, Gottschalk faced hard opposition in his native country, particularly in the person of John Sullivan Dwight, who was the editor of Dwight's Journal of Music and one of the most influential American music critics of the 19th century. Dwight, along with many of his contemporaries in the musical establishment, had a very narrow view of what constituted quality music. In short, Dwight held that the symphonies and sonatas of Beethoven uh, should be held up as ideal examples of musical quality and other composers that dared to stray from that path by incorporating folk music or popular tunes into their compositions were merely wasting the time of the audience. I don't suppose Dwight was familiar with uh, Beethoven's settings of Irish and Scottish folk songs or perhaps Wellington's Victory, which quotes uh, God Save the Queen and all kinds of other things in it, um, so he just sort of ignored those pieces that Beethoven had not really written about, of course. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, Dwight was none too pleased with the music of Louis Moreau Gottschalk, uh, writing in his journal uh, on December 29th, 1855, after a recital that the audience apparently enjoyed very much, uh, quote, I have no doubt but Gottschalk would satisfy the musician as well as the public. 
if he would include something more classic in his programs. He may depend upon it. The fame acquired by merely tickling the ear for an hour or so is not the most lasting. He is really a most brilliant and capable pianist and a true artist also. His touch is nervous and his execution very perfect and clear. His compositions are pretty, pleasing also, and often quite characteristic, but they seem to lack intention. There is nothing in them of farther reach than the tympanum of the ear, end quote. The tympanum of the ear is the outer part of the ear, so it doesn't really get into the brain, you know, uh, according to Dwight. Uh, Dwight's opinions about the supremacy of Germanic classical music uh, was indicative of the established American classical music scene of the time, which included relatively new organizations like the New York Philharmonic, which hired primarily German musicians to play Germanic music. Uh, this widely held prejudice toward the great composers of the past influenced the direction of American performing ensembles and music education in this country well into the 20th century. The cult of the composer as genius was, and still is in many circles, a very powerful idea to overcome. Gottschalk did not fit this mold and perhaps unsurprisingly, is still today not a composer whose music is regularly heard in American concert halls, despite his important place in music history. When it came to Dwight's criticisms, however, Gottschalk had a good laugh at his expense when he announced a concert of his own compositions in Boston. Knowing Dwight would be in attendance, he substituted one of his own pieces with a Beethoven bagatelle without informing the audience. Dwight took the bait, of course, and wrote a scathing review in which he lamented the fact that none of the pieces on the recital could stand beside the works of the great masters. Gottschalk did not respond to the criticism openly, uh, but one imagines him slyly smiling while he read it. Um, the seemingly endless debate, in fact, still rages today. Is the modern recital hall a place for sublime transcendence, a place for pure entertainment, or a combination of the two? And if it is a combination of those two things, how do those activities uh, comfortably coexist? This is a question that is constantly at the heart of programming decisions made by both classical and jazz concert presenters every day, and one that we as audience members should be cognizant of. We see the legacy of Louis Moreau Gottschalk both in these philosophical debates and as a model for the life of the modern traveling virtuoso who has to deal with the seemingly incongruous task of entertaining an audience while maintaining one's own artistic vision. I believe Gottschalk's ability to successfully negotiate these two important aspects of musical life both on the printed page and in the concert hall as well as his unique place in the prehistory of jazz music, places him among the most intriguing figures in American music and is more than enough to warrant further study and more frequent performances of his work. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions about Gottschalk or about other musical um, matters that I might help you with? Yeah. Wait for the mic. Um, I guess before <laughs> before the era of the telephone and the telegraph, how did Gottschalk and sl and given the very slow mail system between countries at that time, mm -hmm. how did he ever arrange these long tours? You know, that's a very good question, and he um, it was done by mail, and he was invited various places uh, and had a very large network of of friends and people that he knew. Um, but it was done very slowly and surely, and that's another reason why when he would go to South America, for instance, he would stay there for three or four years and go from place to place and stay one place for a little while, get the next gig and go on. And these things were very slow moving and very extensive. So that's why in, you know, in, the, in the thing I read from his diary, he was saying that he was just completely exhausted from this life of the nomad artist. Because he would he would go to these places, ship you know on a ship obviously, and then have to stay there for an, for a very extended period of time to sort of make the rounds. So yeah, that was that was pretty much it. Other questions about? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. 
What language or languages did he grow up speaking? Well, he grew up speaking French and he grew up speaking English. Uh, and a lot of people said that his French was better than his English, uh, even though he grew up in New Orleans. Um, but those were, his, those were his primary languages. And if you look at um, his uh, published music, most of the time uh, the titles are in French. And he, he um, related very much to French culture and the culture of Paris um, that he was in when he was a teenager. So yeah, ma mainly mainly French and English. He m he may have spoken other languages as well. I'm not sure about that, but I know that his two main ones were were English and French. Did you know Georges Bizet? No, I don't think so. Um, Bizet was born in the 1830s uh, when Gottschalk was already doing his thing, uh, and I I couldn't imagine they actually had ever they ever. Born? Um, Gottschalk was born in uh, 29, 29, yeah. So it was like, yeah, um, but uh, Bizet was a bit, had a, took a bit longer to get where he was going and wasn't writing his music until later. Um, but I, I would imagine that uh, the whole sort of uh, trendiness of using Spanish music in compositions, which is something that was really happening in Europe a lot in the, in the 19th century. It, uh, to a certain extent, Gottschalk was, was innovating this stuff, but, uh, but also he, he had one foot in sort of the trends of the day. So it, was, um, it wasn't like he just was doing this out of nowhere. You know, like I was talking about with, with uh, Chopin. I mean, he had very clear, um, very clear models for what he was doing, um, but he was just doing it in his own way. So, and there isn't really a relationship between him and, and Bizet in any sort of real way. I use that as an example simply because it was the most familiar uh, habanera that people probably knew. It wasn't to imply that there was any sort of direct connection. Any sense of improvisation versus the written composition? Well, I think you hear uh, in the written composition um, a sense of his improvisation. I think it's very much like um, very much like the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, where he where he writes down. He has a structure that is very familiar, but then essentially is writing out all of his ornamentation, and that's why we, as 20th century listeners, latched on to the music of, and 19th century listeners too, latched on to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach and not say Telemann, for instance. Because Telemann writes the music and then lets you, lets you ornament it and improvise on it. Um, Bach writes everything out and you do it exactly like it's, like it's done there with a few added things. But I think Gottschalk's very much in that mold in that um, you, you're hearing what he played like. His piano music is very idiomatic uh, for the instrument, and you're hearing the kinds of things that he would have done in an improvisation in the written uh, page. So I think it's that that uh, is very much there to to hear. I, I don't get a sense that he he would certainly improvise in his concerts, but I feel like it was very much in the style of what he wrote down. Yeah. Yes. Gottschalk's music, uh, of course, you could playlist the long orchestras and so forth, people who go over the decades to indicate the 19th, 1920s, all the, the people orchestrating his piece rather than others who might be very experienced. You could turn to the piano people who were in the regular presentation as well. Yeah, um, he was, he, I have, well, to answer your question uh, right up front, I have not. Uh, I'm not aware of that, uh, that kind of detailed study being done. Um, I do know that when he was in South America, he, uh, during the end of his life, he did write a couple of symphonies and also a, a not really a concerto, but a, a piano and orchestra piece um, to be played by a rather large orchestra. And he had gotten together so many people for this concert that... Um, there were some hundreds of people on stage, according to reports, um, and had written these larger works 
primarily because of, I think, what, you, what you're hinting at, which is you, you get into the, uh, into the uh, you get a larger audience in the orchestral world than one would as a simply sold pianist, and having the works performed by others, that sort of thing. Um, but no, uh, I don't think that those orchestral pieces that he wrote, I've never heard of them being performed other than when he conducted them when he, when he wrote them. Um, I, they probably have at some point, I, I'm just not aware of them. And as far as orchestrations of his piano music, I, I don't know of any. Um, David, do you know of any? No. Uh, it's, it's, and David's kind of a transcription expert, so that's why I asked. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm not aware of that, and that probably has a lot to do uh, with why we don't hear his music quite so often, because it really has to be a, a piano recital. Uh, he did write some songs um, that are more sort of sentimental parlor song type things. Um, he wrote one called The Last Hope, which in its day was very, very popular and was uh, performed quite a lot and sold quite a few copies of sheet music. But that's the way that you really see his popularity is through sheet music sales more so than, than performances. Um, and pieces like La Bambula were, you know, breaking records all over the place in that regard because he was admired as a pianist and people wanted to sort of copy his style. Um, but as far as actual public performances, I wouldn't think there'd be very many at all. Um, yeah, so other things? Did you, was there another question over here? Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, as nations or subcultures, uh, in terms of appreciation of Gottschalk today, is there any particular area or country where Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I, I don't have my finger on the pulse of all of that, um, but uh, I've not read of any evidence that there is sort of a, a real, you know, heavy got shock, you know, admiration society in, you know, Puerto Rico or something like that. Um, I think that his, well, definitely his music was more popular in Europe because of the novelty of it than it was uh, in the United States even at the time. Um, but the, the problem comes with this idea of popular sounding music, which is really what he wrote. It was, it's very entertaining and, and there are lots of modulations and interesting harmonic movement and all that sort of thing, but he's not writing sonatas. And so for a pianist to get up in the context of a classical music concert and play Gottschalk, it's one of those things that sort of goes on the end of the program, if you know what I mean. Um, and with jazz pianists, um, they, don't, they don't tend to do pre-composed music that often, so it takes someone like Aaron Deal, who's really in both worlds to a certain extent, you know, mentally, uh, in both worlds to be able to find a context in which this music really makes sense. And so that's one of the, one of the reasons I'm really interested in what's gonna happen in a few minutes, um, because it really is something unusual. So, uh, yeah. Uh, other questions? Got shocking trivia, perhaps? <laughs> Everybody's good? All right, enjoy the concert. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.